Good morning, and thank you so much for joining us for the Celebrating Women in Sustainable Transportation Ooh. webinar. This is the last of our winter webinar series. Um, we know it's spring. We're just happy that winter is behind us. Uh, and this uh, series has been presented by Drive Clean Indiana and Wisconsin Clean Cities. Next slide, please. I'm Lori Cagle. I'm the communications director for both Drive Clean Indiana and Wisconsin Clean Cities, and I will serve as your moderator today. Next slide, please. We are thankful to have a wonderful group of women joining us today as our panelists. Uh, in a little bit, we're gonna be hearing from Margaret Smith, who is the technology man manager for the US Department of Energy's Vehicle Technologies Office. Amy Rosa, Director of Transportation for Wani Community Schools. Belinda Pitts, Director of Business and Brand Management for Countrymark. And Lori Lissick, Executive Director of Wisconsin Clean Cities and President of Legacy Environmental Services. I do want to mention that uh, Debbie Branson of Madison Gas and Electric was scheduled to be with us and unfortunately couldn't join us today. Next slide, please. First, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, the co-hosts for this webinar and the, the webinar series, both Drive Clean Indiana and Wisconsin Clean Cities. Uh, these are two of the U.S. Department of Energy's more than 75 Clean Cities coalitions. Uh, Clean Cities coalitions as a whole work to support the nation's economic and energy security by building partnerships to advance affordable domestic transportation fuels, energy efficient mobility systems, and other fuel saving technologies and practices. Next slide, please. Uh, we thought it was important to note that 57% of the Clean Cities coalitions nationwide are led by women, including Wisconsin Clean Cities. It's something that uh, we're all proud of. Next slide, please. Regarding Drive Clean Indiana and Wisconsin Clean Cities and our roles, uh, both are member-based statewide nonprofit organizations that support the advancement of alternative fuels, alternative fuel vehicles, sustainable vehicles, sustainable vehicle transportation, uh, things like electric vehicles, their charging infrastructure, et cetera. Uh, all of the work that both of the coalitions do help to reduce the nation's dependence on imported oil, improve air quality, support local jobs, drive economic development, and improve, uh, I'm sorry, promote improved quality of life. Next slide, please. So we're gonna dive right into our topic today, which is celebrating women in sustainable transportation. I'd like you all to uh, take a moment to think about what future our female ancestors may have envisioned for us. Next slide, please. So one of the women who I think of when we're thinking about uh, some of the early pioneers and what they may have envisioned as a future for us is Bertha Benz. Bertha was a German woman who was married to Carl Benz of what later became Mercedes Benz. And Bertha was a pioneer in the auto industry and she was also an inventor. She worked side by side with her husband, Carl. And in 1888 was the first person to drive an internal combustion engine automobile over a long distance, it was 65 miles. And during that time, she documented problems along the way and came up with and invented solutions, um, including several mechanical solutions. Uh, she invented brake lining, which was not, uh, nobody realized they needed it before she, she took her trip. Um, the work that she did uh, helped to bring worldwide attention to the vehicle, the patent motor wagon, and uh, got the company some of its first sales. She also held many patents as a result of this. However, because she was married, the patents did not go in her name. They went in her husband's name and the credit went to him. Next slide, please. So let's travel to the, back to the future or back to the present and uh, take a look at where we're at now. That let's look at what the, the real future held for Bertha. Next slide, please. So if you look at numbers today in terms of women in this sector, we can see that 15% of the employees in both the transportation and goods movement sector are women. 
and that women hold just 32% of the positions in the renewable energy and renewable fuels field. Uh, 45% of those uh, 32 of that 32% uh, are administrative positions, so they're not higher level executive positions. Um, one of the reasons that's been cited for this, there was a 2019 study by the Mineta Transportation Institute at San Jose State University. Uh, they cited a lack of female role models and mentors as a significant deterrent to women joining the transportation industry. Next slide, please. We're fortunate that we have these four women here today with us who are working to buck those trends, who are fantastic role models and mentors and are helping others to see themselves in these positions. So I'd like for you to please join me in welcoming Margaret Smith with the U.S. Department of Energy's Vehicle Technologies Office, Amy Rosa from Wanee Community Schools, Belinda Pitts from Countrymark, and Lori Lissick with Wisconsin Clean Cities and Legacy Environmental Services, Inc. You can all turn your um, camera and your microphones, and we will start our panel discussion. Ladies, thank you for joining us. Welcome. So uh, I wanted to let our, our attendees know that we will be taking questions if we have any and if we have time. So feel free to type those into the chat. We'll try to get to as many as possible after the panelists are done with our discussion. Uh, first, let's start uh, by telling us very briefly a little bit about yourselves and your organizations. Uh, Margaret, let's start with you. Thank you, Lori. Um, I work with the U.S. Department of Energy uh, Vehicle Technologies Office, and we host the National Network of Clean Cities Coalitions excited to um, have Wisconsin Clean Cities and uh, Drive Clean Indiana as part of our program. Uh, we, uh, as a technology manager at the Department of Energy, I am responsible for providing a programmatic direction for the National Network of Clean Cities, as well as a direction for our DOE National Laboratories that provide a phenomenal uh, resources and tools and technical assistance to our stakeholders and I manage a portfolio of uh, DOE-funded projects from our annual uh, competitive solicitation. Oh, I will, I will also add, I'm very excited within the past year, uh, energy and environmental justice has become a big priority within our team, and I'm, I'm the lead uh, for that work and for our program's uh, Justice 40 initiative uh, pilot effort to maximize the benefits of our work that flow to uh, disadvantaged or underserved communities. That's great, Margaret. We appreciate having you as a uh, as a partner for both of our organizations. Uh, Belinda, can you share a little bit about your background and work with Countrymark, please? Absolutely. Thank you, Lori. Um, thank you for the invitation to be here. Uh, I am Belinda Pitts. Uh, I work for Countrymark, um, Director of Business and Brand Management. Um, I have been in the industry for 30 years. Um, I graduated from Purdue University with a degree in Ag Economics and Ag Communications. Um, today, my job um, involves um, promoting um, fuels for the company that I work for. So Country Marks in the fuel business, we got involved with Drive Clean Indiana um, and its predecessor companies um, because we uh, were one of the original and, and big supporter of uh, renewable fuels. Ethanol and biodiesel were um, key to our company. We were a farmer-owned cooperative. Um, so that was part of, um, that's how we got involved. Um, my job responsibilities today include um, fuel quality. Um, so it's my job to make sure um, that we're hitting our fuel quality standards, whether it's renewable or um, conventional. Um, and then also the growth of our brand, you know, how are we expanding? Uh, we partner with Drive Clean Indiana at, at bringing um, electric charging stations to our retail fueling stations, et cetera. Um, trying to look at what trends are coming and how we can provide um, energy products that are valued to Indiana consumers. Um, so that's a little bit about me. Belinda is also on our board of directors for Drive Clean Indiana, and we appreciate her uh, her service. So thank you so much. Thanks, Belinda. Amy, can you share a bit about your background and role with One E Community Schools, please? Sure, thank you, and welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Amy Rosa. I um, came into the transportation industry um, to the bus driver seat back in the late 90s from bank finance uh, to spend more time with my kids. So in about 2007, I found myself in the administrative seat here at Wani Community. We're a community of about 
6,000 people, or we have about 30,000 students um, from two different communities. And my daily tasks include getting kids to and from education, which is not seen as a light task. And also we are very pleased to be able to do that. Thank you, Amy. Amy's a great partner and is doing wonderful work. And Lori, can you tell us about your background and roles with Wisconsin Clean Cities and Legacy Environmental Services, please? Sure, and as one of the hosts today, thank you so much everyone for being with us. Um, I'm Lori Lissick with um, Wisconsin Clean Cities and Legacy Environmental Services. Lori already shared a little bit about what Wisconsin Clean Cities is and I serve as the executive director. Um, but all this started back with our company, Legacy Environmental Services, which my husband and I started in 2003 um, to kind of fill a void back then in the transportation sector. And we knew we always wanted to have a business. We weren't quite sure what we wanted to do. We merged our backgrounds. He was, had been in the environmental industry. I had been in the business side of things um, and have an accounting background. And so we started Legacy Environmental Services. And from there, we got involved with the Clean Cities program and knew that it was a, a great opportunity to be able to promote alternative fuels and transportation um, in Indiana. From there, we grew to um, Wisconsin and have been I've been serving as the executive director there since 2011. Great, thanks, Lori. Uh, we're really fortunate, as all of you can see, to have a group of wonderful women in the sustainable transportation sector with us today. Um, I know you all kind of went over a little bit about how you kind of got into uh, this work. Did any of you have other women who inspired you to enter this profession or who mentored you when you got here? Um, and what were some of the things that stuck with you from those experiences? I, I would love to jump in on this one. Um, I had no idea that alternative fuel vehicles existed or that the Department of Energy existed until after 2008 when I got married and left my job in stormwater management and moved to a new city and started looking for a, a new job and, and our, our new home. And I connected with Jill Hamilton from Sustainable Energy Strategies uh, because somebody I knew from our church was neighbors with her and she was looking for somebody to, to work part time, um, you know, just, I, I don't know, maybe 20 hours a week to help with writing a grant for um, for biofuels for that particular summer. And so I started working with her and learning about alternative fuels and clean cities. And I worked with her for almost a year while still uh, trying to get my foot in, in the door on a new career path and a full-time job. And when an opportunity came up at, uh, at a contracting organization to the U.S. Department of Energy, uh, they asked Jill if she knew anyone and she put my name forward and I ended up uh, starting to to work as a contractor to the team at DOE managing the uh, the DOE Clean Cities program. Uh, Dennis Smith, the, the director, Linda Bluestein, the co-director, Mark Smith, who's now a program manager at DOE. And if it if it weren't for that connection with Jill, I would never ha I'd never be in this position I'm in today. Um, but after 10 years of serving as a contractor that, to that team, I transitioned over to being part of the federal team. So. Uh, during the past year and a half that I have been a, a federal member of the, that DOE team, both uh, our director and co-director have both retired, and we are all working to, to fill those big shoes and take on those responsibilities and, and continue to, to steer the, the program forward. Um, and Linda Bluestein was a fantastic example of, of a woman a leader in, in sustainable transportation, as well as, you know, Lori, many of our other longtime Clean Cities coordinators, and um, and other other leaders in our program, Wendy Defoe at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, Marcy Wood at Argonne National Laboratory. There's just so many amazing women in this field, and I personally have have gravitated um, to to seeing how those how how women who have managed both career and motherhood have navigated that, because that to me um, has been the biggest hurdle or uh, hurdle challenge to balance with my career goals. Sure. Aren't, aren't we fortunate to have so many people that we can just rattle off within this program that we, we know so many women who, who are involved and inspiring and, uh, you know, and are wonderful examples. Would anyone else like to, uh, like to speak to, to women who kind of helped them when they were, were starting out? 
I'll, I'll chime in. Um, I, when I got started in the industry um, 30 years ago, there were not, Lori, a lot of women um, that, uh, that I had, but I did have some, you know. Uh, Anita Steger was the executive director of the Indiana Soybean Board, and she hired me um, two years out of college um, and really just continued to believe in me, you know, just continued to say, you've got great ideas, you've got great instincts, um, keep going with those. And she pushed me and um, was really very challenging, you know, really pushed back and said, this isn't your best work, do it again, you know, and, and it was those opportunities to do it again um, that truly made me better. Um, Lori Lysick was um, a great uh, role model when I joined um, the Clean Cities world. Um, I also, because I'm from central Indiana, um, knew Kelly Walsh. Um, she also was very um, supportive to say, hey, you need to get out there. Um, so many of the Indiana school transportation directors are female. Um, we've had uh, Monica Coburn, um, et cetera, who, you know, continued, they would call and say, hey, would you help me with this? And it was that opportunity to collaborate um, and forcing me to do some additional research um, that really made me um, a better value to my company and to the people that I serve. So yeah, great, great role models. So important to have people who challenge you, you know, yes. and excellent. Amy or Lori, did you want to chime in? We can move on. If not, that's fine. No, I, I love that piece of challenge. Judy, uh, Judy Dahlstrom from South Bend is a transportation director. She's now at Penn Harris. I met her early on through STAI, through those Indiana transportation directors, which, uh, as you mentioned, Belinda, a lot of us are female out there. But she just, she was like, know your stuff. Like, nobody can argue with it when you know what you're doing, you know your stuff, and you can contribute to the improving, you know, school transportation. So it was more about the job than the gender, but she really was like, get in there and uh, don't, don't, don't back off and, and, and keep learning always. That's great advice. Yeah. yeah, I'd have to agree with all of that. And I think um, for me, I mean, when, when Carl and I started our business, uh, we weren't working with a lot of women in, in different industries. But once we got involved with the Clean Cities program and I was able to connect with other women that were doing the same thing and um, being able to be mentored by women that had been doing this for a while. And then also just seeing the younger generation coming up and being able to um, talk with them and just really learn from each other. I think that has been, uh, you know, so vital. So um, in my previous careers, I've had lots of women that have mentored me and um, that have really made a difference. And when you look back on your career, you can just see all of those stepping stones that we were able to use to bring us mm -hmm. to where we are today. And sometimes looking back on those, uh, the, the early work, can really help you see how far you've come. You know, you look at some of the things you did at first and go, oh gosh, when we first started, we were doing this and this and this, and look, look what we've done. You know, it, it makes it makes a big difference, it makes a huge difference. And, and being able to acknowledge like, hey, we've, we've done great work and, and we all need to be proud of it. Um, why do you think it's important for women to have leadership roles in this industry? I think we could probably go on for a long time about that. Um, but I, I think, you know, specifically, do you think that women bring something different to the table when we're talking about sustainable transportation? And that's open to anybody. Lori, I think that we do as a gender. I think we are naturally wired um, to do some things very well. I think we are very empathetic by nature. Um, I think we're very nurturing by nature. I, I know that drives me on a quality standpoint. The thought that a child would be stranded, uh, you know, we, we fuel a lot of school transportations, public transportations. And I think that that drives the, myself and other women on our team um, to a very great de degree. Um, the thought that other people are relying on us and their safety is dependent on what we do um, is critical. I, so I think we bring um, that uh, natural skill um, to the table. And I think anytime you can bring diversity um, to conversations, you really come out with far richer outcomes. I think everybody would agree. Anybody yeah, I think else? I think that diversity, that's what I was going to say, is we just bring a different, we have a different thought process sometimes. And I, I think that we can bring a different um, spin on projects that we're looking at and might look at things a little bit differently. So the diversity in that um, is always, a, always brings a better outcome to the projects that we're working on. 
Absolutely. And add to that, they always talk about, you know, you don't need everybody to be, um, to play first base. You really do, you need that diversity. And so we really talk a lot at our company about play your part, play your role, um, learn what your skills are, what can you bring to your customers, to your communities um, that, that's needed. Um, you don't have to be exactly like um, the pitcher. You don't have to be exactly like the catcher. You've got unique skills um, and make sure that you're not trying to be somebody you're not, but instead you're playing your role because it's that diversity um, that really creates the strongest team and gets you the farthest uh, in the long run. Great advice. Margaret or Amy, anything to add to this? Couldn't say it any better than that. <laughs> you know, I um, I know when we're talking, you know, and I know we're talking industry, I know we're talking um, kind of public, private, nonprofit, but you know, in the you know in in the individual consumer sector, women make most of the purchasing and health decisions for families. We know this. Um, purchasing sustainable vehicles and equipment are better for air quality. They're better for human health. Um, we, you know, there's a lot of un, unsung heroes who aren't at kind of the top levels of these organizations who are just making small personal decisions every day. You know, with their with their homes and their own decisions that are making a difference in air quality. They're making a difference in sustainable, um, you know, fuels and technologies. You know, even energy conservation by making small changes every day. So I didn't want them to go uh, unrecognized as well. Um, as we go on, can you share some of the challenges that you faced as women in uh, what we see from the statistics is still a male-dominated industry and, uh, and how you've worked to address them from a professional standpoint? I, know well, I, I can share one example. <laughs> um, when, uh, when I started working as a contractor to the Department of Energy, um, I had a strong technical background, an engineering degree, but no knowledge of the actual way uh, the Department of Energy uh, worked or the Clean Cities coalitions or alternative fuels. So I didn't have that subject matter expertise. Um, but I had a lot of um, potential and skills to bring to the, the job. Um, but my job responsibilities that, that first year or two uh, included answering phones and taking notes on many different meetings. And I was determined to break free from, from that role of, um, and, and it wasn't just because I was a woman, there, there were men in that position before, but you know, as a woman, I think it is harder to break out of that mindset of you, you meet these hundreds of different people and you're the one who answers the phone and takes, takes notes. Um, and I, I, I was determined to both do that well and ask for more and, and ask for more responsibilities and ask for the types of responsibilities I wanted. And both, uh, Dennis Smith and Linda Bluestein were, were fantastic. They, you know, I, I say I can do more. I, I say I want more and they, they, you know, offer me some, some work, see, see how you do. And I do that as well as I possibly can and then ask for more on top of that. And, and I think I was able to, to take a position that initially had a very um, simple set of responsibilities and turn it into something more complex and something that brought more value and, and helped me become the subject matter expert in alternative fuels that I wanted to be and made me qualified when the federal position came up to, to step into that role and be the, the leader and take on the realm of responsibilities that I wanted to have. I love that idea of writing your own script, Margaret. You know, it's okay. I'm I'm going to ask for more, and I'm going to you know I'm going to craft my path the way that I the way that I need to. That's fantastic, um, Amy. I we had talked a little bit about kind of your your role in this male dominated field a little bit, and I, I really liked your your take on that. Could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I really had to stop and think. Oh, yeah, I'm a woman in a male dominated field. Although in Indiana we do have a lot of women leaders in transportation, so. But what Margaret said, she nailed it. You know, I'm doing well and I'm asking for more. Like, I just all falls back on that passion and skill and knowledge. And um, I, maybe I have been blind to some things. I've had, you know, I've had those days. Like, you know, when I, when I first came on, it was common sense to me, garbage in, garbage out, put in good fuel quality. So I went strong on fuel specs and good quality and um, 
then years down the road when, wow, that actually worked. We're not towing buses like we used to. You have to really be careful not to then say, I told you so. So, um, uh, yeah, really proud of some of that, but really with partners that we found along the way to um, sit down and get educated. And Country Mark was huge with that for us. So thanks, Belinda, to you and your team. Because as we asked questions, they answered, and then we tested some things out. So just all to say, um, I don't know, I just kind of move forward. Maybe it's my personality. I probably push past some of those naysayers you know, along the way. They're still in the dirt back there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Lori or Belinda, do you have anything to add? I would add to Amy's comment that, um, especially for anybody who's listening in, um, make sure you write down your goals. I think um, I, I think that was um, some advice I got early on, you know, hey, where do you want to go? And, you know, to write that down, um, because I think life can kind of push you in one direction. And if it's written down, you know, you kind of go, okay, I'm, I'm going the wrong direction, you know, kind of get together, you know, with your tribe and say, okay, I really am wanting to get here, you know, what assignments can I have? And, and to what Margaret's saying, you know, hey, I get, you know, there are things that just have to happen, you know, got it, I, I'll, I'll do those. But I want to be, you know, a subject matter expert, I want to be um, in this role, you know, and make sure you don't drift, you know, don't let somebody else decide what your destiny is going to be. Make sure that that's yours. That's great, Lori. I I know you you know you're in you know very much a, a male dominated area. Um, <laughs> well, what if some of your well all of us are? What have some of your experiences been? Um, you know I I can't say that I ha I've had a lot of you know bad experiences. It's just it's just different experiences um, where you sometimes feel as a woman that you do have to prove yourself. I mean, I've been, you know, in the work environment for, um, like Belinda, over 30 years. And um, in the beginning, you just feel like you have to prove yourself. And like Margaret said, I would just take on more, even with my former employers when I worked for someone else. I would just ask for more and wanted to always do better and wanted to challenge myself. And um, like uh, Belinda mentioned, having the go those goals written down. If you don't have your goals written down and know where you want to go or know what you want to do, you can't get to that goal, but you also can't look back to see how far you've come. And I think as women, sometimes we don't um, recognize how far that we have come or give ourselves credit. We're always striving for that next thing. And so sometimes we just have to sit back and with having the goals written down, you can kind of look back and say, hey, we have come a long way. And and as you mentioned earlier, Lori, looking at things that how we used to do it and how we're doing it now. So it's just so important to be able to, to go back and to reflect on some of that. And I think um, that's part of what I've learned, you know, through the career path um, is being able to reflect and and know what I did. And as Lori mentioned, I do live in a male dominated world. And like Margaret, I have two, two sons and my husband and even our dog was male. So um, <laughs> it was, uh, um, you know, I, w I was I was that female, but I did have a, a good mentor in in my mother. She was a, a working mother when a lot of mothers didn't work, and raised three daughters. And we all have professional careers, and um, not that you know that doesn't make any difference. But she she you know we watched her, and so we mentored from her, and um, really learned along that path. And um, you know, I'm just grateful for all the women that have shown me the way um, through my career. I think that's great. I, I wanted to share something that one of our uh, one of our attendees put in the chat, which is more of a comment than a question, but I think it's it's important to acknowledge. Um, one of our attendees, um, whom I know uh, and is a woman, said uh, that she had uh, a, a negative role model who was a physics professor who made the point of saying that she'd made a cho choice of career over motherhood because a woman just couldn't do both. Um, and uh, so. You know, I, I think you're going to hear a lot from uh, from us as we move on about how uh, all of these women are are doing all of those things and more uh, as we as we continue on with our questions. Um, that was actually one of the things we were going to talk about next. Was uh, I, I know that you know we're mothers. We've had to juggle taking care of children while working to advance our careers. Uh, some of us are or have been um, or will be uh, in the sandwich generation. We're taking care of children and we're taking care of parents and working on our career goals and, and paths. Uh, can you speak to, to that juggling act a little bit? 
how much time do we have? <laughs> you know, I, you know, I can, when I was in bank management, I was very young in bank management and um, we went upstairs to a retirement party for someone who had, who had clearly stated to me over a lunch um, day, um, I'm choosing my career over kids. I never had kids. Well, she quit, she soon retired. And during her, that retirement party, they gave her a rocking chair and man, I was hit square in the face. I had a young son at the time and I thought, well, what's she going to rock? So I, that was a huge turning point for me. Um, we had lost a family member, my sister. So I made some, like you said, Belinda choices and goals, and I'm going to go out and put family first. And then I'm going to move through that and um, ended up back in the leadership role. But yeah, wow, what a balance. And, um, and it is possible. It, it definitely is possible. Yeah, when I when I met Jill Hamilton, the the woman who connected me with Clean Cities and the alternative fuel world, she absolutely shattered my view of the limitations between choosing motherhood or career. I thought that the only way for me to have children would be to um maintain a career and have them in child care outside of the home for you know 40 to 60 hours a week with very little time with them each day um or to completely uh leave my uh, my career aspirations behind and be a full-time stay-at-home parent i did not know there was an in-between and there is an in-between um uh, Jill, uh, Jill showed me this beautiful example of um, running your own business and working really hard when the kids are in school, and then when the kids get home from school, sitting and helping them with their homework and helping them uh, with their reading and being fully present to them. And I was determined to find that balance for myself as well. And I have two children. Um, they're they're now in grade school, but they're spaced. Uh, a year and a half apart, and when each one was born, I dropped my work hours to 16 hours a week. And then as they became less reliant on me, um, I ramped my work hours back up to maybe 30 hours a week. And it wasn't until a year and a half ago that I committed with this DOE job to the full 40 plus hours a week because I maintained having one or two days a week to just be fully present to my children when they were toddlers or preschoolers. And now that they're in grade school and and I can just be um, happy with dinner time and bedtime and weekends together. I'm all in on my career opportunities. And my husband stands behind me with that. Um, and, and we actually made a decision for him to be a stay-at-home dad. And he loves it. And I love it. And it is not a path that I've seen anybody else take before me. Um, but it is a, a path that works well for us. And I just prefer anyone trying to figure out, you know, what you want. There's nothing wrong with being working full time and having your kids in in daycare um, for for most of the week. And there's nothing wrong with deciding that you want to put your career on hold and be 100% with your children all day. There's nothing wrong with an in between path. You need to find out what you want for your family and for your life. I think that's so important. And you, Margaret, it speaks to what you were saying earlier about ask ask for what you want. You know, seek, you know, seek out what you're looking for and at, and ask for that, you know, being able to say, you know, I need to take my hours down. This is what I need to be able to be fully present for you at work and at home. I think that's that's fantastic. Lori or Belinda, I know Belinda talked a lot uh, in our earlier conversations uh, in preparing for this um, about being fully present. And I was I was happy to hear Margaret say that as well. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, it was a lesson I kind of learned early on, um, and I have stuck with it, and it has worked. Um, my kids are grown now, but when they were, you know, I worked when they were little. Um, my rule was I was a hundred percent present where I was, um, and, and it drove. It, it drove. It took time for both parties to kind of get comfortable with that. You know, the kids would call. You know, when they got home from school, and um, and my point was, hey, you know. You know, I text them back, hey, I'm at work right now. Um, I'll be home and we'll talk about it when we get home, when I get home. And, you know, it was that frustration of, hey, I want to tell you right now. And I'm like, I'm at work right now. But when I get home, I want to hear your story. And if somebody from the office called at seven o'clock, I, you know, I take the call and I would say, hey, 
is this is this is something urgent or can I deal with it tomorrow? I'm with my kids right now. And people got used to it. They were like, hey, unless it is something that can't be dealt with, um, she's with her kids, you know, at this time. Um, and, and so that was my goal. It, same thing, when I'm in meetings, I, I turn my phone off, you know, it's like, nope, I am 100% committed to where I am. And, and it also, uh, I highly recommend to anybody that you think carefully about what you say yes to. Um, you know, do you really want to be in that meeting? If you want to be in that meeting, you want to be with that person, be 100% there, focused on that task um, and, and not distracted with what's coming in on text or email. Um, it, it, it's, it's kind of making those decisions, but um, I'm not a big believer in multitasking. I don't think it works. Uh, I think you make your decisions, you prioritize what is really important to you and you're fully present um, for those things. I like how you said they eventually learned if they were calling you after hours. But we we all we teach people how to treat us. Yes. Right. And that that's what that is. That's you know this is these are my parameters and this is how we're going to work together. And I, I think that's fantastic. Lori, you and Carl founded Legacy to so that you could have more control over over those hours with with family and work. Correct. Correct. Yes, that was uh, it. It was a really pivotal moment, I guess, in our in our uh, family life too. Um, our children were young at the time when we um, started our company. They were, I think, junior high and grade school, um, and um, we just knew that uh, Carl had been working a lot of hours, doing a lot of traveling in an, an environmental for an environmental company, and didn't want to be away from that. And um, I had been pursuing some, some other careers and um, we just decided that we were going to put all of our focus on having our own business and um, you know, wanted to make our own decisions and make our own life. And um, he'll, he'll always say that we started the company, we just wanted to be a mom and pop. And I keep saying, we gotta stop saying that um, because we have grown and have had a lot of success with our, with our company. And, um, our children were raised in the um, alternative fuels. That's all they heard about. That's what how that's how they were raised. They both went on to um, go on to college and get their masters. And now both of them have come back and are working with us in the business. So it's kind of gone full circle. And um, it's really rewarding to look back at those times. And and it wasn't always easy, but as Belinda kind of said, it allowed us to be present in their lives. It allowed us to be the team moms. It allowed me to be involved in the booster club in, in high school with them. Um, we didn't miss a game. We didn't miss an event. Um, we were able to balance that career and family. And, you know, we might work late hours, but we worked around our family schedule and it, it allowed us to be there for them. So uh, we made it work for us. And I, I know it's kind of unique for a husband and wife to be working together, but we've been uh, making it work now for almost 20 years as uh, business partners, as well as um, being married. And um, and it's been very rewarding. And uh, I, I don't think there's anything that I would change. And I can say, Lori's my boss, <laughs> um, <laughs> that uh, this family owned company is a family first culture. And if you are fortunate enough to, to work for a, an organization that, you know, that walks the walk, you can do those things and, and you can ask for those things. Um, I've not missed any of our son's events. Um, he plays ball. Belinda, I liked your first base uh, scenario because that's where he is. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, it's it's hard and, you know, trying to juggle all of these things is is tough and having having that support system at work and outside of work makes all the difference in the world. So I, I appreciate being in an organization that does that. So thank you. Um, and don't call me your boss. Lori, she's, she's my friend and she's my mentor and, uh, we are co and uh, we, are, we are all very much part of this family too. I would be remiss if I didn't say that. Um, I wanted to ask, you know, I think we've all been trying to find the positives if there were any at all in the pandemic. Do you think the pandemic and the rise in part-time or full-time remote positions helped with the understanding or acceptance of the need to balance that work home life more uh, or to shed more of a light on the challenges um, 
you know, I think we've all been on Zoom calls or even webinars. Uh, we were joking about that before we came on uh, live with everybody, uh, where maybe the kids, you know, needed some attention in the background um, over the last couple of years. How do you think that might have um, might have changed things or helped in this capacity? Well, for me, it's a well. One, I didn't work from home much. In fact, I you were talking about um, the sandwich generation in your notes, and my dad lived with us for three years, so. I ran as fast as I could to the office to get out of that house. But um, but watching everything that's happened and the acceptance of that, you know, the childcare while you're working. When I first started looking for something to do with kids, I mean, it was transcribing. There was nothing you could do from home. And now it's, it's so widely accepted and, and um, Family First has definitely floated to the top, which is so great for kids and for families. Um, and just watching like everybody working from home and how efficient we can prove that we can become, we are even um, from home. We've really proven to, whether it's to employers or to society, that we can get a lot done in the time that we have um, working from home. So I'm, I'm super thankful for what it offers the future um, for those of us that are coming along that are going to start raising kids here pretty soon and parents. <laughs> <laughs> and spouses, have, as we said earlier, right? So <laughs> yeah. I have watched with amazement at these young women who are balancing children and career and trying to work from home. Uh, Carl and I have talked about that often because I don't know what we would have done. I don't know how I would have handled th that pressure of being the school teacher and the mom and the career woman and you know trying to do all of that with young children at home. So. Um, I think that the pandemic, you know, has taught us that there are a lot of opportunities. And um, as Margaret had mentioned, we just have to find what works for us. And um, I think we're going to see a change in the workforce. It's going to be interesting to see how things, how we progress, I think, in the future and what our workforce and work life is going to look like. And I think a lot of that is going to be determined by, you know, what we have learned um, through the pandemic. Martha, what do you think, or Melinda? I, I work, even before the pandemic, I was working full-time remote. Um, I, I had been physically in D.C. working at the Department of Energy for two years as a contractor, but then you know, my husband got a job in Charlottesville. We moved down there, and that's when we had our, our children. So for oh, eight years, I was, I was working full-time remote from Charlottesville, calling into the meetings physically going up to DC once a month or every two months to have FaceTime with, uh, with the rest of the team and traveling. And I, I could never, and I still, I still have a hard time with it. I, I don't do well with working while being responsible for caring for the children. I know, um, you know, there are ways that people make it work, but I think my mom guilt sets in if like the kids asking for my attention, especially when they're toddlers, and um, oh, mom's on a meeting, go play with your toy, or here's a snack, or here's the tablet. Um, that doesn't make me feel good. So I always had childcare when I was working. I had somebody come in and watch the kids in my house when I was working, or my husband had a flexible schedule and he would watch the kids when I was working. Um, and, and that flexibility allowed me to feel really good that when it was time to work, my kids are being cared for by somebody who is giving them um, their full attention and, and I could give my full attention to my job. And I think I was thriving, uh, working fully remote, but it was not part of the culture within my organization. And it was not part of the culture within the U.S. Department of Energy. I think the pandemic has forced people to adapt to, um, both finding ways to be successful with teleworking and remote working um to, to the best they can uh under under pan pandemic circumstances but i i think it has helped people realize uh that that setup can be productive <laughs> that just because somebody isn't physically in the office doesn't mean they're not getting their job done and now we actually just started our return to work last week and the current expectation is going into the office once a week perhaps up to two times a week so um, I have relocated back up to DC for for um, my uh, federal position, but 
I am going to be able to maintain that, that work-life balance of helping my kids get ready for school in the morning and sending them out the door. And, um, you know, when they get home from school around three o'clock, if I'm not in a meeting, I will go downstairs and we'll have afternoon snack together because I need an afternoon snack also to be able to get through <laughs> the rest, rest of the work day. Um, so, so I hope um, that despite all of the unbearable hardships that the, the pandemic has brought on working mothers and on mothers in general, that more opportunities arise for people to have that balance where they can show that, you know, when they're home and working, they're, they're getting things done, even, you know, even if the kids are around or even if they have to take a break in the middle of the day to pick up their kids from the bus stop and help them with their homework and get more work done in the evening after they go to bed. Definitely. Belinda, you were going to say something. Uh, those are all really great comments. I guess maybe the only thing I, I would add to that is that, um, and I agree, you know, it was a, it was, um, it was a challenging time um, in, in global history. Uh, but one of the things that I think we learned and we got better at was prioritizing um, to say, you know what, because we had people on our team and I'm with Lori. I just, couldn't say enough good things about um, the the team members that we had that were teaching their kids. They were doing lessons. They were 100% childcare. They were doing everything. Um, I didn't have to do that. All I had to do was do my job, you know. And I, I so I was I was so impressed um, with that young generation. Um, they just they were incredible. But it taught everybody on our team that we truly prioritized. We said, okay, let's stop and think about these things. And it was interesting. We were throwing things off the sled going, you know what? Our customers don't care about this. Um, the people that we're serving, they don't, you know, let's let's stack up the things that are really important. And we do those things. And it gave us a chance, you know, you, can, you have those sacred cows and you're like, oh, but they expect us to do those things. And it's like, okay. Let's really step back. Yeah, it was really important to them 10 years ago, um, but people have changed, you know, needs have changed. And so um, it really gave us an opportunity to prioritize and say, here's how we serve best. I think that's great. That's fantastic. Um, I know some of you from our earlier discussion serve as mentors for other young women, um, not only in the sustainable transportation field, but, but within your own companies uh, in various positions. What are some of the things you tell them to help them as they enter their careers? One thing um, I, I make sure that I tell um, the women that I mentor, and, and I have a 24-year-old daughter, and uh, she's in a male-dominated industry as well, um, and so she's my, um, in full disclosure, she's my number one uh, mentee, and so uh, one of the things I always tell her is, you know, someday someone is going to tell you that you don't belong, and I want you not to use your words to say, yes, I do. Don't use your words. Use your actions. Um, Amy talked about it earlier. If you have value and you have skills and expertise um, that the rest of the team values and let that speak for why you're there, the value that you're bringing. Um, it, yes, it's painful. I'd be less than honest. Um, I'm going to venture to say that the other women on the panel, um, like myself, have been told that. I've been told that. I don't belong here. Um, and it does, and I, I'd be remiss if I didn't say it hurts. It does. Um, demonstrate that you do. As Amy said so well, you know, find those skills, those talents, that expertise that people can't live without. Perfect. Amy talked about that a little bit too, about, you know, um, show them, you know, make sure that you know your stuff so that when you're there, it's there's no question about that. Yeah, and I would add to that too. I mean, through those years while I was out there showing my stuff, I'm not gonna lie, I didn't, you know, push the kids aside. It's like if it's not bleeding broke or poking out, you know, don't call me kind of stuff. <laughs> and then, you know, I look back and think, man, you know, you know, did I balance well enough? You know, and and in my job, I have to multitask and it's like a twenty four seven kind of job. So I was able to walk away from the job and help the kids and then walk away from the kids and help the job, but 
it all worked. And I, and I turned down opportunities to go to the bigger district and take that next level. But I guess for me, looking back now, and I can't believe I'm saying that at this point, already being the mentor, um, it's, it's what we do, it's not who we are. And so I'm, I'm really reflecting a lot on who I am rather than what I do. And for the longest time, you know, I was a transportation director and that was 99% of the day. So for those of, you know, that are coming in and they've got these young kids and that balance and the opportunities we have before us to do it all, you know, sometimes we have to go back to like Belinda said, everybody said, set those goals and priorities and, um, and stand your ground. I loved that, you know, um, teach them how we're going to be taught. And my sister's great at that. I've never met anybody. She's like, yeah, I'll work for you, but I don't really like mornings or Wednesdays. And, and, uh, you know, I like my dog to come to work with me and they're like, oh, can we give you a raise? I'm like, oh, <laughs> nice. Yeah. She's, like, she's got this going on. So you all got it going on. So go for it. That's fantastic. Lori or Margaret, anything to add there about what you tell young women coming up? I will say that I'm I'm right at the point now where I, I feel like I still see myself as someone looking for a mentor, looking for people to, to help me grow. Um, and I don't necessarily see myself as somebody who mentors others, but perhaps Perhaps I should. Perhaps I, I don't give myself enough credit and there are things that I could offer to others and maybe I'll um, be more open to, to committing my time to that if, if somebody asks me, uh, asks me for, for help. I think you have a lot to, to share and you're doing it right now. So thank you. Lori, how about you? We work with interns um, quite a bit. We do, we do. Um, I think you know when when we're all talking about this, and I know you know we're we're talking about women and our challenges, but I think it also relates to our sons. I mean, this is a totally different environment that we're working in, and so um, encouraging them and in and, and helping them to to move to that next step and teaching them how to work with women in the workforce and and how they what they need to do. I, I think um, you know they learn by what they see you know and and they and and what what they catch from us so again just like um i think it was amy that said what we do not what we do but who we are and so emulating that not only for our younger generation of women but also our younger generation of men that are coming up and i've always prided myself on um trying to raise them to be good men um not only in their professional lives but also in their personal lives we teach them how to treat us, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's I think that's key. You know, we're um, we're getting a little bit toward the end of our conversation. Um, what are some of the things that you believe we can do as women in this industry, uh, or that you believe that companies can do to help make these types of careers in sustainable transportation more appealing and accessible? Uh, again, kind of getting back to some of those stats where and that that study from San Jose State University, uh, where women were saying. I'm not, you know, I'm not pursuing a career in this field because I, I don't see other women doing it. What do you think we can do to help change that or that companies or organizations can do to help change that? Lori, I think one of the things, um, I read an article um, not long ago about the number of young women, and Margaret talked about it, you know, we get to that point where, you know, we have kids and we, and it's that, it's the exodus. And I think there was also another article I read that during the pandemic, the exodus was even greater. You know, women were saying, hey, I'm checking out, you know, I'm, I'm getting out. Um, and, and if they're fortunate, they let Amy, you know, Amy got back in. Um, that's challenging too. If we as companies and leaders um, can make sure we're having those conversations with these these young employees um, and saying, hey, you know, what are your goals? And for some, it's gonna be, hey, you know what? It works for me, I need to get out. And if so, that's great. But we need to be having those conversations to make sure they're getting out for the right reason. You know, are they getting out because that's the right thing for them to do? Or are they getting out because they didn't have a support system? Um, 
Lori talked about, you know, some innovative ways that we can structure things. And if we if we say, you know what, um, if you really love doing this and this is your skill set, how can we use your skills to maybe, you know, rework this job? Maybe it's part time or maybe it is, um, hey, you're going to do this job from home, at, you know, partially when the kids go to bed, et cetera. What are some creative ways that we can take advantage of these skills uh, that these people bring to the table. You've invested in them. You know, you, you know, these people may have five to 10 years in the industry if we're allowing them to exit because they don't feel supported. Um, we've really lost a lot of talent. Um, we've lost so much of that expensive um, training um, that we put into them. Um, are we having those conversations to make sure that they feel supported? And I, I appreciate, um, you know, the, the, those comments about how to keep somebody in the workforce. I think it's also interesting to consider ways that organizations can, um, when hiring, have an open mind about women who did step away from the workforce to be full-time moms and are trying to get back in and look at that, um, those skills and those capabilities that it takes to raise young children as as valuable uh, skills and capabilities in the workforce. And, and even if it does require a bit more effort training because they haven't been in that particular industry, um, you know, don't don't look at a resume that that has that, you know, five to eight year gap in and in, in working and, and think, oh, this person isn't the right fit for what we need. We want somebody fresh out of college and raring to go. I think too, um, as Lori mentioned, we do work with a lot of interns. And so looking at the different variety of skills that are needed to build this industry and having that variety available and letting them know because they might start in, in one sector of the industry and then grow and ended up in a different sector by what they learned, S similar to what Margaret did and, and you know, kind of made sure that she was learning every step of the way. And then that just keeps moving them along. So being creative with getting women started into the industry and letting them learn a little bit about it and then finding their own niche, I think um, might be helpful um, with mentoring the um, upcoming generation. I would agree if I could just, um, you know, kind of build build on that. You know, m my background, I was a journalist for almost 25 years. And, you know, that industry started to change and people were looking at, okay, well, you know, what's, what's our plan B? It was something that kind of everybody in the industry was having to ask at the time about five or six years ago. And, you know, I... I took the skills that I had. I was not in sustainable transportation. I covered environmental issues, um, but I knew the LISICs and I saw they had an opportunity available, which was not in communications, by the way, um, and you know, came and said, He's, you know, these are the skills that I bring to the table. And that's what I tend to tell others who are you know, anybody looking at a career change, looking at a move, um, and, you know, and the interns that, that we work with and mentor. You know, focus on your skill sets. You know, I think we tend to identify ourselves. You know, you think of, you know, if you're at a party or you're at an event, um, you know, who are you, what do you do? And you, you, you know, your title, boom, comes right out. Now, whether that title is, you know, I'm the communications director, I'm a mom, I'm a wife, whatever that is, however you define yourself. But if you step back from that and define yourself more by your skill sets, those opportunities are gonna be available for you in a much different way. And the skills that we all have are sorely needed at every organization. You know, I think um, you know, we talked earlier about, do we as women bring something different to the table? Um, I think we've all defined that pretty well here, talking about all of the different things that we're able to manage effectively. Um, you know, as, we, as we've worked, uh, worked on, you know, a variety of different subjects. Um, as we start to come to a close, I'm looking at questions in the, uh, in the box here, we're about at the very end. Do we have any uh, final thoughts or advice we'd like to share before we thank everybody? Uh, the questions that are in the uh, the question box, I think we hit them all in one way or another. If we did not, we will have uh, contact information for our speakers shortly. Is there anything else anybody else wanted to say that we did not get to? Margaret's raising her hand. Yeah. I have one thing. Um, 
I think women in particular tend to um, underestimate ourselves. And I have seen many instances where a an opportunity or a task has come up and I haven't volunteered for it because somebody else confidently said they could do it. But then when I see them do it, I realize I could have done it just as well as them, if not better. So even if you're not 100%, you know how to do something, it is okay to say, yes, I can take that on and, and you learn as you go. So don't, don't kind of um, exclude yourself unnecessarily from, from activities or opportunities. Great point. I'd like to just say, um, being part of the panel today, um, you guys have invigorated me and it's, it's nice to be able to be surrounded by, by people that um, are like-minded and, and can help to, to lift each other up. And I think that's the role that women play in the workforce as well. And we need to do more of that and to really support each other. And, um, you know, this is something that, you know, we just, I, I think we just really need to, to build on because more women need this. And um, just being here in this panel for an hour, I feel really, you know, just uplifted by being surrounded by leaders um, in this industry. So thank you for that. Well said, I agree more. Great, well, I want to thank all of you uh, for joining us today, all of our panelists. Thank you to Margaret, Lori, Belinda, Amy, as well as all of our attendees. Um, we are going to be sending a recording of this to everybody, um, and it'll be on the YouTube channels for both Drive Clean Indiana and Wisconsin Clean Cities. Um, so thank you. I'm gonna ask that we have the next slide. We're gonna actually go past that one to one more. This is the contact information for our panelists. So if anybody has any other questions or anything that they'd like to follow up on or maybe network, <laughs> um, please feel free to contact our, uh, our speakers today. And again, this will be uh, on our, our YouTube channels and it'll be on both of our websites. Next slide, please. Uh, we also, for Wisconsin Clean Cities, have a fantastic event coming up April 28th, the Transportation and Innovation Expo at the Alliant Energy Center. This is our second. Um, we have wonderful breakout sessions with fantastic speakers at the national and local levels, um, lots of wonderful information about the latest in transportation technologies, a huge 70,000 uh, square foot exhibit hall that will be full of sustainable transportation vehicles uh, and equipment uh, with exhibitors there. Uh, we are also going to have a ride and drive and a really great networking reception in the expo hall the night before. Uh, you can get all this information on, Wisconsin, on wicleancities.org. And again, um, because this will be in the information that is sent to all of our attendees, you will be able to link through there as well. Next slide, please. Thank you to again to all of our panelists for sharing your stories and your experiences and helping to lift us all up, as Lori said. Uh, you can contact Drive Clean Indiana or Wisconsin Clean Cities at the information below. Thank you all again for attending and thank all of our panelists for all you're doing to help uh, support the Clean Cities mission. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Lori.